Where did Bob get started? All right. So uh, the next, so the next, next thing, the next sort of transition or next chapter of uh, of our lectures in this semester is now talking about logging and recovery. So up until now, we've been sort of dancing around the idea that we're going to write these data out to disk and we'll and we'll make sure that everything is nice and durable. Um, but now we need to talk about actually how, how we're going to do that. How the data is going to guarantee that if your transaction makes it, commits something after making a bunch of writes, that if you stop the system or you crash, you come back and everything's still there. So just real quick, uh, homework five is due today at, at midnight. Project three is due on Wednesday, November 15th. And as I announced on uh, Canvas yesterday, there'll be no class on, uh, on this Wednesday coming up, right? Uh, we have a bunch of uh, scheduling uh, deadline or, or issues with me. Joy has a meeting with his parole officer on, on Wednesday, so he can't actually uh, teach. So we're just going to cancel the class outright. OK? Any questions about project three? OK. All right, so to help us motivate what we're going to talk about today, uh, let's now look so at, a, at a really simple scenario uh, where we're going to have a, a, a transaction. We'll make changes in our database. Uh, and you want to see how we can make sure that everything, uh, what, what, what can go wrong, how we can make sure that, that if we make a write, everything's there. So this is our schedule. So this is where we're going to execute the transactions, basically the operations. And then in memory, we have our buffer pool, right? the same thing you guys implemented for the, for the first project. And then out on disk, we have the disk manager, where we're going to be storing the, the pages of, of, our, of our data in our database. So when the transaction starts, it just does a read on A. And as you know, you look in your buffer pool manager, you see whether the page that you're trying to read is there. In this case, it's not. So we'll go out in the disk, and we'll go now make a copy of that page, and now put it into memory. And now we can read our value. So then, now the next step, we're going to do a write on A. And let's say we, we, we go ahead and do our update. And the update first lands in, in the buffer pool, because all our changes always have to go to, to memory first. right? But now we have a problem where uh, we, the transaction goes ahead and wants to commit. Right? And we want to tell, be able to tell the outside world that, you know, yes, we got all your changes. But at this point, is our change safe? Is our change durable? No, right, because it's in memory. Right? And what could happen is that you could have Hitler come along uh, and cut the power on your machine, and now everything in memory is gone. Right? Hitler's an evil person. Uh, it took me a while to figure out who actually wanted the show, right? Cause, cause you know, if you show sort of people that are in the news now, a year from now they'll be dated. So I went with Hitler because he's like, you know, the Hitler of databases. Hitler is the Hitler of databases. He's just bad, evil, right? So he cuts the power on our buffer pool, uh, on, our, on our system, and everything we have in memory is, is lost, right? So this is bad. If we tell the outside world our transaction commits, uh, then we need to make sure that no matter whether Hitler comes along and kills our machine, that our data is, is safe and durable. Because now, in this case here, we would come back and we'd read back in that page and we'd have A equals 1. So we'd have the old version, even though we already said the transaction was committed and we saved all its changes. So this is the problem we're trying to solve today. Right? This is called crash recovery. And the basic idea is that uh, we're going to have some algorithms inside of our system that will allow us to ensure that our database will always be consistent, uh, every transaction's changes will always be atomic, and that we always maintain the changes for any transaction that commits, and we tell the outside world they commit, no matter how many times we crash and no matter how many times we restart have problems. So a recovery algorithm is essentially comprised of two parts. In the first part, you have all the things you're going to need to do during the normal processing or the runtime execution of transactions while the data system is, is sort of running normally. Right? You, op you open a connection through your application, start executing SQL queries, and you commit. Right? That's, the, that's the normal processing of, of the database system. So we need to, need to do a bunch of stuff during that time to make sure that everything is safe and durable. And then there's also the things we're going to need to do after there's a failure, after there's a crash, and we lose power, and we need to come back and make sure that everything is always in the correct state. So you, for do crash recovery, you need two parts. You need the runtime part and then the recovery part. So in today's class, we're going to focus on the first part here. We're going to talk about what you need to do while your data system is running to make sure that all your changes are durable. So the, for today's agenda, we're going to focus on, a, we're going to try to cover a lot. Uh, 
But we're going to first talk about what kind of failures we're going to have to deal with in our database system. And that will sort of motivate what we can do to, 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 to figure out how to come up with a scheme or a protocol to make sure that everything's safe. Then we'll talk about how we're going to make changes to our buffer pool manager to decide when it's safe to move data in and out. Then we'll talk about one possible implementation to ensure durability called shadow paging. Uh, then we'll talk about write-ahead logging, which is the most common uh, scheme that people use and which we'll be implementing in project number four. And then we'll talk about checkpoints and then different types of logging schemes. Okay? All right, so crash recovery, uh, the way to sort of think about it is that we're going to divide the sort of the database system up into different components based on the underlying storage device that, that the database system is going to use as the backing for, for that data. And then based on the storage devices, now we can come up with different classifications of the types of failures that the database system is going to need to be able to handle for these different storage devices. So in a, every database system, there's, th there's three categories of storage. The first is called volatile storage, which is just memory. Right? And this is typically the fast, uh, the fast you know, DRAM you can re read and write to very quickly. Um, but the key thing here, the reason why it's volatile is because, again, if you lose power to it, the, all your, your data is lost. Um, there has been some, actually some experiments at CMU here where you actually can find that if you, if you cut power to DRAM, you can still read it for like another 30 seconds. Uh, but in practice, nobody actually does that. Right? You lose power, and you assume anything that was in memory is completely gone. Then you have non-volatile storage. And this is where the data will be, be, be able to persist after it loses power. Right? And this is your NAND flash, uh, or NAND flash hard drive and the spinning disk hard drive. And then there's also a third class that we haven't talked about so far called stable storage. And stable storage is a class of storage devices that are able to survive any possible failure you could possibly think of. Right? And we'll show what these, these failures look like. But even if you come and light the, machi light the machine on fire and burn these stable storage devices, uh, your data will still be there, right? Uh, and obviously, this doesn't exist, right? Because if you take a gun and shoot it at, at the, the hard drive, it's gone, right? So we're going to refer to this as sort of in a, in a, as an abstract concept that, oh, we can write this to stable storage. But in practice, this doesn't actually exist. And the way you actually get around this is that you combine multiple storage devices uh, and have redundancy to basically approximate this stable storage, right? Instead of having a single hard drive on a single machine, maybe you spread it across multiple machines or different data centers. And that way, again, if the data center burns down, your machine burns down, you still have another copy somewhere else, right? So it's a sort of a logical concept rather than the actual storage device you can buy. But this is going to be important because this is where we're going to end up putting our logs. All right, so there's three categories of failures we can deal with. We have transaction failures, system failures, and storage, storage media failures. So transaction failures are, have sort of two types. So the first is that you have a logical error where there's some error condition in the, in the actual database itself that prevents the transaction from actually being able to complete. Right? So say you, have a, you try to insert a null value into a table where a particular attribute cannot be null. Right? The data system is going to prevent you from doing that and abort your transaction. Right? This, is a log, this is considered a logical error. Then you have what's called an internal state error. Uh, and this is where the database system is going to abort your transaction because there's some, uh, there's some error condition that is checking while it's running transactions that's going to prevent it from being able to actually uh, complete. Right? And this would be a deadlock that you would have under two-phase locking. <coughs> the next type are system errors, or system failures. Right? And the first one is, is a software failure where basically the, the, actual, the implementation of the database management system has a problem in it. Uh, like there's, there's a divide by zero or uncaught exception, and your transaction is going to have to fail, right? The, we, ideally, we, we hope this doesn't happen. Most database systems are tested very rigorously, uh, like an Oracle, for example. Anytime they put out a new release, it spends month and months on uh, Q&A and testing to make sure that there's no bottlenecks, no regressions before they put it out. Uh, so typically, you, you, you don't have this in a robust system, but you know, it, it can occur. Uh, and, the la and the second one is hardware failures. And this is where, again, you have a, the, the machine that your data system is running on has some kind of uh, hardware problem that, that you know, either the power gets pulled or there's you know, hard drive crashes or whatever, uh, where the machine just basically just stops running. Right? Um, in 
for this type of error, we're going to assume that the, the, the hardware of the non-volatile storage devices we're going to use will not be corrupted uh, if there's a hard stop. Right? In practice, we know that's not the case. Like, I had this happen when I was an undergrad. You pull the plug-in machine, the hard drive could be doing something. It could end up uh, you know, getting, uh, getting corrupted in such a way that you can't boot it back up. Right? Now, for storage media failures, uh, we have to deal with the problem of the actual the, the non-volatile storage is completely lost, right? And again, this is the example I'm saying if you, if you light your machine on fire and it melts the hard drive, right, there's no recovery from that, right? And for this, we assume that the, 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 the destruction of our data will actually be detectable, um, meaning like we'll have checksum errors from the disk controller, or we know that machine caught on fire, right? Uh, so we know that this, this, is a, this is a problem, and, and we as humans can then take actions to actually try to correct it, right? And so an example way to recover this, again, if your machine catches on fire and you melt all your drives, then you, if you have a, a backup version of the database, you can load it in and, and replace it that way, right? So this is the way to think about this. This particular type of error is not something a data system can actually recover from because it requires something beyond what software control can control, right? It requires a human to do something extra to recover your database. All right, so now given these types of errors, uh, we need to think about how we actually want to make sure to, 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 to overcome the ones we can overcome to make sure that any changes we make uh, and for transactions that commit will end up being, being durable. And so as I showed in the beginning, and as, as you know from the, the lectures on the buffer pool manager, uh, the primary storage location of the systems we're talking about here is always going to be on non-volatile storage. It's always going to be an SSD or a spinning disk hard drive, right? But since that's really slow to read and write to those devices, we're always going to use our buffer pool manager as a cache to bring in, the, bring in the, the pages we need so that we can read and write to them very, very quickly. But of course, now the problem is that these things are volatile, so if we pull the plug, we, we would lose everything. So, with non-volatile memory, uh, the bay basically is getting sort of a staging error. We'll, we want to modify data on one page. We make the copy, bring it to our buffer pool manager. Then we make the modification. And then at some point, we need to be able to flush it back out the disk. And at that point, we know that things are safe and things are durable. Right? That's the, the key assumption we're going to make throughout all of this. Right? So for us, what we're talking about today, the data management system is going to need to guarantee that if we tell the outside world that your transaction is committed, then the data is actually durable. So we can survive all the failures except for the storage media failure. Right? Again, if the hard drive melts, we can't, we can't cover, cover that. But we can handle all the other ones. And then if a transaction ends up getting aborted, then if we crash and come back, any of the changes made by that failed transaction would not actually be visible. Right? And the way we're going to do this is using a combination of undo and redo. So undo is the process of taking any changes made by a transaction that did not commit. Either it aborted because of, of, of a failure in our, in our software, or in the logic of the transaction, or because the data system found there was a deadlock and it got killed. Uh, or the transaction simply just you know, didn't complete before the machine went down. Then we'll use undo to roll back all of its changes so that nobody sees them when the system comes back on. And then redo is allows us to then to, to reinstall those modifications made by the transactions that did succeed, and we did tell the outside world that we committed. Uh, we make sure that those changes will persist forever. And the tricky thing is when we have to do this is we make sure that uh, anything that's sitting around in our buffer pool uh, will be able to have some artifact on disk to say, here's the changes that were made in this transaction committed. So how exactly we're going to do this depends on how the data system is going to manage, uh, how the buffer pool manager is going to manage the movement of data in and out of disk. So let's look at an example here. So say we have two transactions. Transaction T1 wants to read on A, write on A. Transaction T2 wants to read on B and write on B. And assume, again, we, we start the system up from a, from a cold start. There's nothing in our buffer pool manager. There's nothing in memory. And then we have out on disk, we have a single page that has the objects A, B, and C. So when transaction T1 starts, it does a read on A. And again, we don't have this in memory, so we have to make a copy into our buffer pool manager. 
And at this point, it's an exact copy of what we have out on disk. Then we do our write on A. And again, as I said, we always make the modification to the page in memory first. So now the, the, the object A in memory has been modified. So then now we switch over to transaction T2. He does a read on B. That page is already in memory, so we don't do anything special there. Then we do a write on B, and we overwrite its value now. So now we get to this point here, we want to commit. So the first question we've got to deal with is, how should we make sure that these changes are durable? Right? So one obvious thing you could do is you basically take that page and write it out immediately out to disk, and once that's flushed, then you tell the outside world that your transaction has committed. Right? But what's an obvious problem with this? Wait, say it again, sorry. Right, A is not committed, but it made a change in the same page that, so transaction T1 made a change to an object that's in the same page as the object that T2 modified. So if we just take this and write, write the page out, uh, then now later on T1's gonna abort and we need to roll, roll it back, but now we have nothing in our system that would say, oh yeah, T2 made this change, it, it should be there, and then T1, uh, T1 made a change, but it actually didn't commit yet, so not have it really there, right? Now you could say, well, why don't I just make sure that I only write out the, the, the changes that B made out to the disk page, right? The, well, now it, that requires you to do a bunch of extra work, because now you need to make sure that, all right, well, I'm writing this page out, and this, this, this tuple here was modified by this transaction, and it committed, so I can flush that, but this other one didn't, so I can't flush that and I gotta make a new page in memory, then copy that out. It's a bunch of extra stuff you have to do, and I'd have to think about it, but there's no guarantee that this, this would actually work. Okay, so there's two policies we gotta talk about now in our buffer manager that we'll use to decide when is it okay for us to write out dirty pages like this, that with changes that have not been modified yet. So the first is called the steal policy. So the steal policy determines whether a transaction that has not committed yet is allowed to overwrite the most recent committed version of that, uh, or value of that object in our non-volatile storage out on disk, right? So if you say you're using the steal policy, then you're allowed to flush dirty pages out the disk that, f that contain modifications that were made by transactions that didn't commit yet. If you stay, say you're using the no steal policy, then any page that contains data from an uncommitted transaction has to stay in memory. It essentially gets pinned in memory and the data system is not allowed to write it out. The next policy is, is called the force policy. And this says whether the database management system is, is required to flush all the pages made, or all the pages that were modified by a particular transaction at the moment that the transaction goes ahead and commits. So if you're saying, you're, if you are using the force, and pol force policy and it's enabled, then when that transaction commits, all those changes have to be written out, right? And this, again, this sort of, this goes against the, 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 the no steal policy because the no steal policy says you can't write out any dirty pages. So you would have to do that extra work, as I said, where you have to make the copy and make sure the pages you're, you're writing out only contains the data from the transaction that actually committed. If you're doing no force, then you say you're allowed the transaction to commit, you can tell the outside world your transaction committed, uh, but you don't have to flush or f flush all its dirty pages out. And of course, that means we have to do something extra because if it's hanging out in memory, then we can still lose our data. So we're, if we're using the no force policy, we have to do some extra stuff to make sure that everything sticks around. So now the force policy makes it really easy to do recovery as we'll see in a second when we talk about shadow paging, because when you crash and come back, you know that, that on disk you don't have any changes made by transactions that didn't commit yet, right? It only contains the, trans the data from committed transactions, so when you come back, the, the database on disk is good to go, right? So this makes it really, really easy and really fast to do recovery, because you just come back and everything's okay. But it's actually gonna be really bad for performance, because now what's gonna happen is, Every single time you have a transaction commit, you have to then pick out the pieces that you actually want them to write out to the disk to make sure you don't contain the uncommitted changes. Then you have to do an F-sync 
or you know, flush out to the disk exactly all those pages, and then wait until that's done until you tell the outside world that you committed. And now you got to be careful about scheduling because if you have transactions trying to do this all at the same time, then they're going to be blocking each other doing doing a bunch of s-syncs. So the spoiler is going to be that we're going to end up using uh, steel no force, but I want to go through an example of what no steel force looks like. Right? So with no steel force, okay, no steel means that you're not allowed to write out dirty pages from uncommitted transactions before the, uh, the transaction is committed. And then force says all the pages that a transaction modified have to be flushed out before you can say that it's committed. So again, there's the same transaction we had before, T1, T2, T1 wants to read on A, write on A, and T2 wants to read, read on B, write on B. So transaction T1 starts, does a read on A, copy everything back into our buffer pool, then does a modification, then uh, T2 starts, does the read on A, uh, then does the write on B, and then it goes ahead and commits. Now at this point here, because we're using the force policy, all the changes that T2 made have to be written out to disk at this point. So we'll write everything out and do a flush. But again, because we're using no, no steal, that means we want to pick out those changes from uh, T1 and make sure they don't actually make it to disk. So again, we'd have to keep track of who's, who's modifying what uh, and, and when we want to commit uh, T2, pick out the ones from t changes from T1 and only write out the T2 changes. Right? So you do your update like this. And then now when, when this guy aborts, it's super easy for us to roll back T1 because there's nothing on disk we need to reverse and we just, we just undo the things we did in memory. So again, with no steel force, this is the easiest thing to possibly implement uh, because you never had to undo the changes from, from, from a boarded transaction because they never made it out to disk. Uh, and you never have to redo any changes from a committed transaction because they always got flushed out to disk too. So again, you come back and the database is, is perfectly the way you want it to be and you don't have to do any recovery. What's an obvious problem with this? Performance is one, but think, think, of, a, uh, think of a bigger problem, like ignoring performance. So again, yes? Yeah, so his comment is that uh, I'm ignoring what, the, what, the, what the, the hardware can actually provide in terms of atomic rights, typically on a page level. So if I transaction only modify one page, I can f-sync that, and that's going to be atomic. If I have to modify a ton of pages, then I can't f-sync that and have that be entirely atomic, right? So the, the hardware is going to guarantee sort of you know, one page at a time. So that's one issue. Uh, and with that, for that, we'll, we'll ignore for now. What's an obvious problem here? So what does no steal say? No steal says that is, it, is the data system allowed to flush out dirty pages from uncommitted transactions? He says maybe like a deadlock. I'm thinking something more, more simplistic. Memory. Memory, exactly. My database has a billion tuples. I need to update all of them but I can only store one million tuples in memory, this doesn't work. Because under no steal, you can't flush out, you can't write out the disk any dirty pages from the uncommitted transactions. You can't modify the entire table because you can't fit the entire table in memory. Right? So that's, what, that's the obvious limitation of this. All right, so I think it's worth, from, from, from a sort of historical perspective, and actually spend some time looking at one possible implementation of shadow paging, uh, the memory issue is one, the, the, but the, what I'll show here it actually solves the, uh, the atomic issue that he brought up. But the memory issue is always, always going to be the big one. So with shadow paging, shadow paging was actually in, invented by IBM on the System R team. Right? This, is the first, this is how they first designed uh, their storage manager and buffer pool manager in, in System R. Um, but they ended up later, later abandoning it for, because it has some obvious limitations. Um, but the main idea of shadow paging is that you're going to have essentially two copies of, of, of the database. You're going to have the, uh, you have the master copy that is guaranteed to be consistent because it only c contains the changes of committed transactions. And then you have the shadow copy, which is essentially the staging area for transactions that are currently running 
and it's where all their writes will go. So you can sort of think of this as at a high level, this is sort of like multi-versioning, uh, but instead of doing multi-versioning at a tuple level, you're doing multi-versioning at a page level. And instead of having uh, you know, any number of ver different versions of a page existing at the same time, under shadow paging, it's only, it's only two. Right? You only have the master version and the shadow version. So what's going to happen is transactions are going to run, and they're only going to make changes to our shadow copy of, of the database. And then when a transaction commits, we will flip a pointer that says the current, the new master version of our database is now the, the, the old shadow copy. And we can do that atomically to, so that way if our changes span multiple pages, uh, we're just flipping a single, single root pointer, and that makes everything become immediately visible. So shadow paging is an implementation of, of no steal force. Because we're going to force that all the transactions changes, get, get written out the disk at the moment that it commits, and then we're not allowed to, to swap out any, any, uh, any pages for, for, um, from dirty, dirty transactions, or dirty uncommitted transactions. So the way you're going to implement this is that you're going to organize now the, the database in a, in a tree-like structure where the root of the, of, of the tree is going to tell you whether you're pointing at the master or the shadow. And because the root is essentially going to be a, is a, is a single page, we can guarantee at the hardware level that we can do that atomic write to flip that pointer to point to uh, either the master or the version. And so when, when, the, when the transactions show up, they'll figure out whether, uh, you know, they'll find out where the shadow copy is and they'll start making all their changes there. So essentially it looks like this, right? So this is just the single master version without the shadow, right? We're going to organize everything as a bunch of pages. And then these pages in memory are essentially pointers throughout what, where they're out on disk. All right, so now to install the updates, as I said, all we have to do now is just flip that pointer on the root to point to the, the, the new master, or sorry, the, the shadow which becomes the new master, right? And we'll have to write out that, that swap to that root pointer out the disk as well at a, at a known location on disk so that when we come back, we look at that location, and that, that'll tell us where to go find the starting point of, our, you know, of, of, of the current master. So let's walk through an example. So say we have a transaction comes along, T1, and when it first starts, once it once starts making modifications, we first instantiate a shadow page table, which is essentially just a copy of the master page table, and all its pointers point to the same records out on disk. Right? So this point here, but the shadow and the master are, are exact copies of each other. But underneath the covers, there is only one copy of the database, the, right, the actual disk pages themselves. So at the top, if, if any transactions are read-only, then they can always go through the, to the master page table and read a consistent snapshot, a consistent uh, you know, version, a copy of the database. But any transactions that want to modify things will always have to go through the shadow pages. All right, so now as our transaction runs and it starts making changes, to pages in the shadow page table, we'll create new copies of these pages uh, on disk, and then update these pointers. And then when the transaction goes ahead and commits, we then flip the pointer from the database root to now the shadow page table. So now, at this point here, all the changes made to the shadow page table are now visible. And we can guarantee that we can recover after a crash because we come back, follow the database root, and find our consistent uh, view of the database from the from the the new master, All right? So here we don't need to maintain a log file, or do anything extra. All we have to do is flip that pointer, store that pointer out on disk, which we can do atomically because it's, it's a single page, and we can come back and immediately have the database in the correct state. And of course, we have to do garbage collection because now we have we have this old page, page table, with like the old master, and we have a bunch of pages that are not pointed to anymore by the by the new uh, master page table. So we have to go through and scan through and, and, and clear these things out. Yes? Can we solve the memory issue by adding a virtual connection? Say it again? Can we solve the memory issue that I just mentioned by adding a virtual commit? What do you mean by virtual commit? Like, we, internally, we internally like commit, make a commit, and begin like, between the I, I don't, I don't know. So if you have multiple transactions running, so I, I'm showing one example here. You could have multiple transactions running 
and they're all modifying the shadow page table. And then as a batch, you go ahead and commit them. And then you switch over to, to the, the, new, the new master page table right then and there. Right? So I'm showing one, one transaction here, but you could have multiple transactions running at the same time. And then all the two-phase locking and the other stuff we talked about before still applies here as well. But you can't commit one uh, out of the whole batch. Correct. You can't say this one transaction committed. Right? You have to take everybody. Because otherwise, you basically now have to have figure out multi versioning inside of the shadow page table, and then you're just you're back where you started. Right? All right, so again, with shadow paging, undo is, is super easy because you just blow away the, the shadow, shadow uh, page table. The, you don't update the root, so no one ever sees, sees those changes, and there's, there's, there's nothing to. to, to there's no words that transactions reading uncommitted data. And there's no redo at all because as soon as we write out the database pointer at the root, then immediately everything is, is persistent, immediately everything is durable. Right? So this seems really awesome, right? This seems like a, a sort of a, a good idea, but as he sort of brought up, you can't commit single transactions in a, in a large batch. Um, and there's other issues like now you got to copy around the entire page table every time. Um, you can try to be clever and copy only the pass in the tree. Um, but again, this is just sort of adding complexity to the implementation. Um, and then the commit overhead is high as well because uh, every single flush will every single flush will update every it will have to flush out every single updated pages and the page table and the root. Um, over time, your data will get fragmented, right? Say if you do a bulk load and have everything nice in uh, sort of in, in sorted order. Now you can't do in-place updates to those things because now you're going to have a bunch of pages for different parts of the table here, a bunch of pages for different parts of the table over there. And now it's where it gets more expensive to do a sequential scan. And of course, you need to do garbage collection to go through and prune out these things and clean them up. So again, as far as I know, the only data systems that's still around today that do shadow paging are LMDB and CouchDB. Um, no other, you know, those are the only two, two systems that actually do this. Everyone else actually does the write-ahead logging stuff we'll talk about next. All right, so the key observation, again, from shadow paging is that uh, we have this problem where we need to write out these non-contiguous pages on disk when we do a flush to make sure we, we, everything's always is consistent. But if you think now on a spinning disk hard drive, uh, that essentially is doing a bunch of random writes. Because right, now you're going to have doing writing different sectors and different parts of the disk platters, and now the, the arm is, is jumping around and doing these writes in different locations. So this is becoming less of an issue now with really fast SSDs and non-volatile memory when it comes out. But historically, this was actually a big, big problem. And it's part of the reason why the IBM guys eventually ditched uh, shadow paging. And ideally, what we want to be able to do is that we want to have a way to convert our, uh, our random writes to disk to be single sequential writes, which are much, much faster because we can batch things together. So this is essentially the problem that write-ahead logging is going to solve. So write-ahead logging, or WAL, W-A-L for short, is the idea where we're going to maintain now on disk a separate file that's independent of the, or separate from the actual database disk pages that's going to contain log entries where we record all of the changes that transactions made to, to our database. And the idea is that any time we make a modification to a tuple in a, in a regular table page, we have to put an entry into the, the log file first. And then if we're going to flush out now a dirty disk page that was then modified by transaction, we need to make sure that we write out the log entry first. Right, so you have to write the log entry first before you're allowed to flush out a dirty page. And that way, if there's a crash, you can come back, look in the log, and figure out, well, what actually happened? What, did this transaction actually commit? What change did it make? And should it actually be there or not? So write-ahead logging is an example of using steel and no force. Steel means that, again, we're going to be able to allow the data system to flush out dirty pages from uncommitted transactions before, you know, before it actually commits, which we can is OK, because we're now still have the log file. So we'll know what that change was before we write it out. And we know how to undo and redo it if necessary. And then no force means that we're not going to require that the, all the pages that the transaction modified are written out the disk 
at the moment that the transaction commits. Now, we're going to have to flush out all the log entries. That we do have to force and flush out. But in terms of pages itself inside the buffer manager, we don't need, we don't need to flush all of them. OK, so the idea, again, we're going to have all these log records. And they're going to contain information about what changes the transactions made. And that a transaction would not be allowed to be considered fully committed. We can't tell the outside world your transaction is safe and durable until we know all of its corresponding log records have been written out to stable storage. And the reason why I'm saying stable storage here instead of uh, non-volatile storage is, again, we want the stable storage to be the end all to be all storage location of our log because that's enough information for us to be able to restore the entire database and put it back into the correct state. The log is going to be all the information we need about what, how the database got changed over time, and we can always recreate it from that. So we want that to be indestructible. We want that to be replicated and stored as many times as possible. And so that way, if the data center burns down, we still have our database log. We can still recover the database state. OK? All right, so the protocol is uh, fairly straightforward. And so what will happen is that when a transaction starts, you're always going to write a begin message to the log. And this is basically saying that there is some transaction that existed. It started with this transaction ID. Um, so we know to expect it uh, down below. Then when a transaction com commits, we're going to write out a commit record. And we'll have to flush all the log records that came before the commit record uh, to ensure that everything is, is durable. Right? You don't want to have, like, you, you made a bunch of changes on a table, and then you write out the log record. Uh, you write the log records for those changes, but then you flush the commit record before you flush the change records. So you come back and you have a transaction that doesn't have any changes because you missed everything. So this is making sure that everything's done in sort of sequential order. All the log records get flushed, and then the commit record has to get flushed. And that tells you what the boundary of, of that, what the, the transaction changes. Now, for the modification log records, uh, we store some basic information, like the transaction ID, the object ID of the thing that you modified. Right? In, in, in the simple terms, it could just be the, uh, the record ID of, of the tuple. Um, but then you're going to have the before value and the after value. The before value is going to allow us to do undo. Right? If, a, if a transaction made a change and a transaction doesn't commit, we can use the before value to put back that, that, the, the value to the way it was before that transaction actually, you know, actually made, made the change. And that makes it as if it, it, it didn't actually ever execute. And then the after value ensures that if, if we crash, we can, we can restore that correct value if the transaction was considered committed. All right, let's walk through an example. So we transaction T1, uh, wants to do a write on A and write on B. So now in memory, we're going to have our buffer pool like we had before. But then we're also going to have an in-memory staging area for our write-ahead log. And so when the transaction starts, we write a log record that says transaction T1 began. Then we do a write on A, and we write the log record for that transaction T1 modified object A. The before value was 1, and then the after value was 8. And that gets written to the log. And at this point, this is all still staged in memory. Nothing's actually written to disk yet. Then we do a write on B, same thing. We have the transaction ID, the object ID, and the before and after value of the object. And then we commit. Now, at this point, when we commit, we, we flush out the log uh, to add on disk. And at that point, the transaction is considered durable and safe and committed. So in this point here, although we have not updated the on disk pages for, our, for, the, for the database, because we know that our log records made it out to disk, that it's now considered safe to tell the outside world, tell the application that our transaction is, is committed. That if we stop and crash and restart, all those changes that it made will still, still be there. So how we're actually going to go through the log after a crash and figure out how to restore the data back, back to the correct state, that's what we'll discuss next week in the next lecture. Right? So again, if we crash here, there's enough information in that log that's going to allow us to restore the, the, the database to the correct state. So any, any questions about this high-level idea? Yes? Mm -hmm. So the question is, when you write the log, you always write it to stable storage. And again, stable storage is this higher level concept. Most people just write it out to the same non-volatile storage that you, know, you write your, your regular disk pages, right? You, you know, some hard drive you have in your machine or, or EBS. Um, 
But ideally, you want to, you know, you sort of think that this is like the treasure, of the, the, the most important part of the data system for all its changes because this tells you how things got modified. So you want to make sure that no matter what, you don't lose that. Because that's, enough, again, there's enough information there to be able to put us back to the correct state. So in this example here, I didn't show, like when we first started, when the system booted up, there was already A, B, and C set with, with certain values. I didn't show actually those things being inserted, but the log would contain information about what the transaction that inserted those entries. So we could lose the disk pages, uh, but as long as we had the, the full log, we always know how to restore and put us back to the correct state. Is there another question over here? Yes. The question is, uh, is, is the benefit, is the performance benefit come from, from this that we can transform random writes into sequential writes? That's a big part of it, yes. Because again, in this case here, this was, you know, I have one page, I only modified one page, and then, you know, we just write that one page out when, when we want to flush. But if A and B were on two separate pages on different parts of the platter on a spinning disk hard drive, right, or say they were actually in a distributed system, they were on different machines. I would have to do a flush on both of those two pages if, you know, in order to make sure that they were durable. But with the log, I only have to flush one page, and I get modifications that span multiple pages. So that's one, one aspect of it, right? What was contents of what? Okay, his question is, will the... Will the the, the amount of data you have to flush for a log, would that be less than the amount of data you have to flush if you're flushing directly the pages? Uh, typically, yes. Because again, you, you can pack multiple tuples on a single page, and most of the times, maybe only, you only modify one tuple. The amount of data you have to log right, is, is much less versus like writing out the entire page. Now, we'll get to this, but eventually you still have to write out that page right, when you take checkpoints because you want to make sure that you know, uh, that these, these things eventually make it to disk. Now, I said the log is enough to restore the database to the correct state, but an obvious problem is if, you're, if, you, if you've been running your data system for like a week or a year, your log would encompass that year, you'd have to crash, and, and unless you have a way to restart quickly from the, the existing pages, you have to replay the entire log, right? And that would take a long time. So, uh, typically, yes, you write less. The log has everything you need. But eventually, you still want to write out those disk pages. OK. So from an implementation standpoint, there's two questions. And I sort of covered this already. Uh, so the first issue is that when should we actually write out the, the log entries to disk? And the answer is that when the transaction commits. And to avoid the issue that I said before, where with shadow paging or writing out dirty, uh, just doing force all the time, where you have to do f-sync for every single time a transaction commits. You can use group commit, which is essentially just batching together a bunch of entries uh, made by multiple transactions into a single buffer, and then do a single f-sync to flush that buffer out um, in a group, rather than waiting to do f-sync for every individual transaction. So this is actually what you're going to implement in project four. The way you essentially do this is that you maintain two buffers. You have one buffer where you stage all your, your log entries. Any transaction can, can write into that log buffer. doesn't matter if they've committed yet. And then when that buffer is full or there's a timeout, then you, then you, you go and take that, that staging buffer and have that be the flushing buffer. And you have another thread write that out. And then you use the other buffer. The old flushing buffer now becomes the staging buffer. And you have all your writes go, go into that one. Right? And again, the way to think about group commit is that if you're the first transaction to put something into the staging buffer and you need to wait to it flushes, you're going to wait the longest because uh, you have to wait until the buffer is full or there's a timeout. But if you're the last transaction to put something in that buffer, then you'll get a really fast response because it's the same thing as you running f-sync immediately. So on average, this, this, um, in the worst case, this, this, you know, you're doubling the amount of time you have to wait. But on average, this, this maximizes the throughput you can for, for doing flushes. All right, the next question is when do you actually write out the dirty page directors to disk, right? Uh, this, again, essentially is the buffer pool manager's responsibility to figure this out. Because we're using steel, the steel policy, the buffer pool manager is allowed to write, write out dirty pages anytime it wants. So it can do it uh, every time a transaction does an update or anytime it commits. 
Typically, it doesn't actually do this. It does that LRU stuff that we talked about before, where you look to see what, what pages do I have in memory, which ones are pinned, which ones are dirty, and then figures out which ones to, to write back. All right, so now one observation we could have is that um, if we can prevent the database management system from writing out these dirty records until the transaction commits, uh, then we don't actually need to store the original values or the before values in the, in the, in the actual log record, right? So say here, I, again, my log contains two log records for transaction T1, does a write on A, then a write on B. If we ensure that no pages of this transaction actually got written out until we actually commit, then we don't actually need to store the, the before image. We can, we can take those out entirely. Right? We still got the flush of the log record first. Right? That has to get written out first. But if we ensure that uh, we don't actually write out the pages themselves, uh, then we don't actually need this. Because right? so what would happen is if you, if you crash in these two scenarios here, in the first case, if you crash, then you just replay the log and just put back in the, uh, the changes that, you, that you, want, you want there to be there. You don't care what was there before. So you could be overwriting the same change, but that's fine. You always go back to the correct state. In this case here, you can simply ignore T1's updates because uh, those pages never got made it out to disk, um, and therefore you, 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 know, you don't have to undo anything. Right? You simply just ignore these things entirely in the log because you don't see the commit message. So this is, again, this violates the, this, this is the example of the no steal policy. It's sort of showing you why the steal policy is something you want to use. Uh, and that just because you're using write-ahead logging doesn't mean you couldn't use no steal. You could still do that. But in general, again, we always want to use the steal policy, right? And as I said, this is because that we want to be able to support transactions that have to update a, a data set that's larger than the amount of memory that you have. And you want to make sure that you can write out changes uh, from uncommitted transactions to make new, new, new space in memory in order to take in, bring in more pages and modify those guys, right? And so we always have to keep the undo information in, in the log because if we write out those dirty pages and our, our transaction aborts, we won't have a way to reverse those things. And we, and we would have, we would persist changes of transactions that didn't actually commit. So this is why we have to use the steal policy. So another way to think about this is in terms of these two sort of quad charts here. And so to think about these different buffer pool policies and how you would actually implement these things, you can think about it in terms of both the runtime performance and the recovery performance. So the runtime performance is how fast you're, you'll be able to process transactions uh, normally when you, during execution. And with the uh, steal policy, uh, if you do no force and steal, that'll be the fastest for performance because with no force, you're not flushing out anything. Uh, with, sorry, with no force, you're not, you're not requiring that you have to do an f-sync immediately when the transaction commits, and you're allowed to write out dirty pages. Um, with force no steal, which is the case of uh, sort of using shadow paging, that will be the slowest for performance because you have to do all those f-syncs to make sure all the changes are, are written out atomically at the disk first before you can say the transaction committed. So. Steal no force will be the fastest for the runtime performance, but it's actually going to be the slowest for recovery because you have to go through the log and again replay all those entries. Whereas in the case with shadow paging, it's the fastest because you come back and you don't have to do anything. The database is already in the correct state because you don't have any changes made from uncommitted transactions. So again, this is just showing that there's this trade-off between getting really fast runtime performance, but also having but but making recovery slower. And this is why every single data system chooses to use no force and steal because they rather have, they, they assume the, 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 the normal case is that you're not going to crash every, every 20 seconds, right? So they're going to make a design decision that they're going to choose to use no, steal, no force steal because that's going to make you faster to run transactions. And then yes, recovery will be slower. There's some ways to make them speed them up using checkpoints, which we'll talk about next. But in practice, you assume you're not going to have to recover all the time so it's better to make the runtime performance be the fastest as possible. So this is sort of clear. Again, there's this dichotomy between the runtime performance and recovery time. And most systems choose to optimize for performance. Right? And again, the, the, 
the steel no force is with no do and redo, but force no steel is with no do, no undo, no redo. Because right? you don't have to recover anything. Yes? His question is, is there a combination of force and steel? Uh, right, so steel would say that, you, that you're allowed to write out dirty changes. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you, you could use, yes, yeah, so you could use write ahead logging to do that too, right? So force would mean that all the, the pages that made modified by transaction have to be flushed out the disk when, when it actually commits. So that means basically anything in the buffer pool that was modified by the transaction, you flush out immediately when it commits. But because you're doing steal and you could write out pages from uncommitted transactions, you need the write ahead log to make sure that happens. So force steal is essentially saying that you, you're, you're doing the extra step of forcing all the pages to be flushed out when the transaction commits, even though it's actually unnecessary because the log has already been written out and you know that's you know, that's durable because you've already, you've already F-synced those guys. So you're doing, you're forcing yourself to write out pages that actually don't need to write out right away. And then you have to do that extra step of figure out, oh, well, this, this page contains modifications from this transaction and this transaction didn't commit yet, so let me pull those things out and make sure those don't get written out. So you're basically doing extra work when you don't need to. Yes? So you don't have to redo those. So, His statement is uh, you don't have to redo if you do that. Uh, because once you commit, all the things are doable. Correct, yes. That, that's true, yes. But again, I, I, that, that, it's going to make runtime performance slower, and no one's going to no make that trade off. All right, so as I said, right ahead logging is the way most systems are implemented. Uh, and actually, when we talk about in memory database system, systems, the more modern ones, they also still use right ahead logging with, with a slight, slight variant. But what's one obvious problem with write ahead logging? I think I've already mentioned that I already mentioned this earlier. If my data system has been running for a year, my log is going to contain all the changes from the last year. So he says you have to compact it in the background periodically. That, yes. So that's yes, more or less. That, that's essentially what a checkpoint is. So the log, Red Hat log is going to grow forever. And ideally, what we don't have to do is we don't want to have to boot our system up and then figure out, here's the beginning of the log, and figure out what actually needs to be uh, replayed and put back on, on our disk pages, right? Because that'll take a long time. So what we're going to do is that we're periodically going to take a checkpoint where we're going to flush out all the dirty pages in our buffer pool and write them out the disk. And then that way, we know that those changes are now durable. Um, but they still may contain changes from uncommitted transactions, but again, we can use our write-ahead log to, to figure, figure this out. So with the checkpoint, basically, we're, again, we're going to write out the stable storage, uh, all the log records that are sitting in memory, and then all of our modified blocks, and then we can write out a new checkpoint entry to our log that says, at this point in time, we know that anything on disk is, contains the modifications from any transaction that comes before our checkpoint. Um, so you don't need to go back too far in the log to figure out what should be uh, redone, or uh, you don't need to go back too far in time to figure out what should be undone, right? Yes. His question is: Do we assume in this for this particular sort of scenario here that the 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 checkpoint is being written out to stable storage as well? Yes. Yeah, so in this example here, we're going to assume the checkpoints are written to stable storage, that you can come back, load the checkpoint from that, and then replay the log from stable storage as well. Yes. OK, so again, we're going to write this checkpoint entry to the log and say anything that comes before this, uh, those changes have been written out to disk. Right? So let's look at a simple example here. So we see at the bottom, uh, we're going to have a crash. Uh, but in our log, we have a bunch of we have three transactions: T1, T2, T3, and they're they're, they're making a bunch of changes. Um, so at this point here, uh, we know that any transaction committed uh, before the checkpoint. Sorry, we, when we take our checkpoint and we come back after the crash, we would look at our log, 
And we say, all right, well, if I scan through, I find this checkpoint. So I know that at this checkpoint, any transaction that committed before my checkpoint, all its changes made it out to the disk pages and are durable. Because I have to flush, the, I flush the, the, the pages and the log record when this occurs. Um, in this case here, though, T2 and T3 did not commit before the last checkpoint. So we got to figure out what to actually do with them. So in the case of T2, we're going to have to redo all its changes. Because if we look beyond the checkpoint in our log, we will see that transaction T2 ended up committing. So we're going to need to make sure that all its changes after the checkpoint are actually uh, are persisted. In the case of T3, we don't see the commit message. So it crashed after our checkpoint. So if T3 made any changes uh, prior to the checkpoint, we need to make sure those things get, get rolled back. So in this example, though, I'm being very hand wavy about the, the checkpoint mechanism. Uh, but I will say that for this, I'm actually assuming that the checkpoint stalls the entire database system while you do this. Right? So there's no situation where a transaction could come, modify a page. Sorry, a transact we start our checkpoint, we write out the disk page that, that's dirty, and then while the checkpoint is doing other parts of the system, working on other parts of, the, of, of memory, another transaction modifies that page we've already written out. Uh, so therefore, we would lose that. I'm assuming that we have a consistent check consistent snapshot of the contents of memory, and we can write them out the disk atomically. That's not how Alex data systems actually implement this. Uh, we'll talk about fuzzy checkpoints uh, next class. But I, I sort of want to understand the, 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 the high-level idea of what this is going to do and how this speeds up recovery for us. So the issue we have to deal with is that well, there's two, two questions. So the first question is, like, how often we should, we should take checkpoints? Um, and then we've got to figure out what kind, of, you know, what kind of information we want to store in our checkpoints. So if we take checkpoints all the time, uh, as I said, we're stalling every, all the transactions while we do this. That basically is, to, again, there's this huge pause in our system while we take the checkpoint. Now, as I said, with fuzzy checkpoints, we can allow transactions to keep on making, making changes while we take the checkpoint. But for now, we'll, we'll, we'll ignore that. So if you checkpoint all the time, then that's basically going to slow down the system because you're not processing transactions, you're taking a checkpoint. And instead of writing out log records that, for the, that the transactions need as they're modifying things, you're writing out the disk pages as part of the checkpoint. So that's going to slow things down. So there's sort of this trade-off between taking checkpoints all the time and speeding up recovery, sorry, but then slowing down the system. But then if you don't take them too infrequently, then that's going to make recovery uh, take, take much longer. So there's no hard and fast rule or, or sort of you know, magic number I can tell you to say, yes, take a checkpoint every five minutes. Different applications or different customers will do different things. Um, but this is usually something you can set in your system. There's always going to be a knob to say how often you take these checkpoints. And it could be how long, you know, you, how, how many dirty pages you want to sit around your buffer pool before you write things out and take a checkpoint. Um, or it could be a periodic thing, right? So there's no, there's, again, there's nothing I can say, like, this is exactly how you, how you should tune your system to do this. It depends on, on the particular environment. Yes? So we do it in a higher granularity. So when we read, like, Rackler, we just compact it. It's really the long. So you, your question is, can you do it at a higher granularity? What do you mean by that? Like, Things we have to like, compute, compute like its final value, and we have to compact always like previous log. If I do that, we could save the like uh, concentrated time to. Like, Wait, so, so, I, 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 you're saying that it, it, you could you compact the log that contains all the changes made to a particular tuple, so that when you when you come back, you don't have to replay a bunch of entries. You just play the last entry because that's the last thing you should see. Uh, that's essentially what sort of the checkpoint is doing, right? The, che the checkpoints for the, for all, for the entire database, yeah. right? So like, say I have one tuple, and I do a million writes to it, right? If I, if I don't have a checkpoint, 
then yes, you could, you would have to replay all those million updates. We'll see next class, that's how the recovery protocol has to work. But what you're basically saying is that if I take a checkpoint here, and then whatever that last update was, that gets written out to the disk page. And the data system will know that I don't need to go back and look at the other 999, you know, thousand updates because the last one is actually what got written to the disk page. And that's the only one I care about because that's, that's the one that should be visible. So the checkpoint is essentially doing compaction, but not explicitly compacting the log. It's doing it on a disk page level. It's a good point, though. Okay. So now the next question is, uh, in our logging scheme, is what information do we actually want to store? So there's essentially three categories of log records or log rec uh, logging schemes you can have in your, in your database system. And so the first one is called physical logging. And this is where you're going to store the, record the exact changes you made on a byte level to specific locations in the database. So the way to think about this is to say I update a tuple and the tuple is inside of a page. In my log record with physical logging, I'll say this page at this all set, at, at this byte, here, install this byte sequence. The other end of the spectrum is called physical, or sorry, logical logging, where instead of storing the low-level physical changes on the, in, in the individual bytes that you would make to a page, uh, we won't just record the high-level operation we did, that the transaction did on the database. Right? So think of this as like you just record the SQL statement that you, that you executed um, in the log record. And that's enough for you to actually go back and replay it because you just re-execute the same SQL statement again. So the key thing about this is that in the case of physical logging, the, you have to have one log record per page. So if, if you do an update in a single query that updates multiple pages, you have to have a log entry for every single in one of those pages. But under logical logging, you just have the single SQL statement, which may span multiple pages, uh, and that's enough for you to then, you know, figure out how to re-execute it when you, on recovery time. So obviously logical logging uh, in practice will store much, much less, less information than physical logging because if I update a billion tuples with a single select statement, or sorry, single update statement, a single SQL query, I only have to have one log entry for that single SQL query under logical logging. But with physical logging, if I have a, a million pages, I have to have a log entry for all those one million pages. So the downside with logical logging, it seems sort of obvious that it seems like this is actually what we want to do, but in practice it's actually hard to implement recovery because it's hard to do this with concurrent transactions with a non-deterministic uh, concurrent to protocol. So what I mean by non-deterministic is that you could execute the same tr two transactions in this exactly the same time after recovery, on, on the, the, when you're recovering the system, and because of like race conditions in in scheduling, like who gets the lock first, one transaction, one query might actually get executed before another one does in in sort of physical time. So you would have to store a bunch of extra information to say this lo this logical ro log record executed before this one and it made these updates to these pages before this other one, right? You'd have to install or put extra information in the log record to say exactly how two logical queries were interleaved. Now, in a system like VoltDB, they don't have this problem because they're doing serial, serial, they have single-thread execution engines where only one transaction can be executing one SQL query at a time at a particular partition. So they don't have to record any of this extra information they, because they're single-threaded. But most systems aren't like that. You allow multiple threads to run at the same time on, on the same data, and now because of OS scheduling or whatever, whatever else happens in the system, the logical ordering the second time around during recovery not be, may not be the same as the first time around. So that can end up with an inconsistent state, and now your, your transactions aren't, aren't durable. The other problem with logical logging is that it's going to take much longer to do recovery because now it's going to be executing exactly every single SQL query over again. So if the query ran for the first time and it took one hour to run, during recovery, it's going to take one hour to run. Right? There's no magic during recovery that's going to make this thing go faster. Um, so that's going to, again, if you, if you can't have a lot of downtime, this is going to be a, a bad, bad choice. So the hybrid approach, sort of trying to get the best of both worlds, the one that fits, sits in the middle, 
It's called physiological logging. And what's going to happen here is that it's going to be uh, sort of like logical logging where we're going to record at a high level the change we want to make to, a, to, to, to data. But we're going to do this like in physical logging where we're going to have a log record per page. And then when you crash and recover, you know how to replay the, 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 the entry in the log to apply that sort of high-level logical change to the, to the data that you modified in, in an individual page. So this is, this is the most popular approach. This is what you use in most database systems because it's a nice trade-off between physical logging where it's very exact, exactly how you want things change, and logical logging where you have sort of a high-level thing that you replay. Right? This sort of gets the, the best of both worlds. All right, so let's look at a simple example here. So say that we have a table foo, and we want to update a single attribute called value and set its value to XYZ. And then we have, and we're doing this based on its primary key, where ID equals 1. Under physical logging, you're going, to you're going to record exact information about the table you're modifying, the page, the offset, and the before and after value. Um, I don't talk about index logging too much. We'll cover that next class. But we'll have to do essentially the same thing now for the for information about how, how we're going to record changes to indexes. With logical logging, the only thing you store in the log record is just the SQL query. And that's enough for us to be able to replay that and put us back to, you know, ideally back to the same correct state. Um, and then in the physical logical logging, instead of storing the offset, we just store the, the object ID. And the advantage of this is that when we come back, again, we know how, we don't care about exactly are we modifying this particular offset. We would look in the page, find object ID 1, and then go ahead and make that modification. Right? So again, the lo physiological logging is doing it on a per page basis, but the, the modification can be done at, at, at a higher level. Right? So for example, if you said, say, like value equals value plus 1, we would store that on, on the physical logical logging rather than the exact, uh, exact byte sequence. OK. So to finish up, uh, what I've talked about today is, is primarily focused on write-ahead logging. Uh, and that's the most important scheme that's used in most database systems. Um, and this allows to handle the loss of data modifications made by transactions to our pages that hang out in memory. Um, we can replay the log and put us back to the correct state. And by using steel and no force with checkpoints, this is going to allow us to allow our, the transactions to modify data sets that exceed the amount of memory we have to our system. Uh, and we're not going to require to have to force all our changes out to disk first for the disk pages when a transaction commits. We just have to make sure that our log records get flushed out. And then on recovery, all we have to do is un undo the uncommitted transactions using the before images in our log records to put us back to the correct state. And then we redo the committed transactions to ensure that all their changes are durable and persist beyond the crash. Okay. All right, so next class, we'll now talk about Aries. So Aries is, a, uh, is the, sort of the gold standard of how you implement recovery uh, using the right-ahead logging in a you know, disk-oriented database system. Uh, it was invented by IBM in the early 1990s. And every single database system that uses right-ahead logging implements some more or less variant of, of Aries. So I'll cover it at a high level um, how it works. And then this is what you guys will be implementing, a sort of simplified version of this in Project 4. So I would say sort of as a, as, a, as a teaser for what we're going to talk about next class, the big, big issue that I didn't talk about today that Aries will handle are doing crash recovery during crash recovery. So if you crash and have to replay the log, if you crash during the replaying the log, what do you actually do? And that's what Aries can handle. Right? And that's the tricky thing. If you crash during, if you crash after crashing, how do you handle that? Aries can do that. Okay? All right, any questions? All right, again, no class on Wednesday. Homework 5 is due tonight. Project 3 is due Wednesday night. Uh, and then we will start up again Monday next week. Okay? All right, guys, thanks. See ya.